If you've been subscribed to this YouTube channel for the last few years, then you'll know I have a low-key obsession with ground effect vehicles. I find it so fascinating that they're able to float on a cushion of relatively high pressure air that holds them just inches above the surface. Although these things may appear to be pretty stable at this altitude, flying in the ground effect can be a bit of a balancing act sometimes. For the most part, the ground effect is a negative feedback loop, or in other words, a self-stabilizing system. When the aircraft gets too low, the cushion of air under the wing builds pressure, which pushes the plane up. And when it gets too high, the cushion of air loses pressure, which decreases lift and makes the plane come down. This feedback loop is more or less what makes passively stable ground effect vehicles possible. But it turns out there's a different feedback loop that fights against the ground effect and makes it harder to stay at the right altitude. As a wing nears the ground, it starts to make more lift in the back. Or in other words, the center of pressure shifts backwards. That's a problem because if the center of pressure is too far behind the center of gravity, the plane is nose heavy and it will want to nosedive into the ground. The opposite is true too. If the center of pressure is too close to the center of gravity, the plane is tail heavy and it will want to pitch up. So if we're designing a ground effect vehicle, we're going to want to make sure the center of gravity is the correct distance in front of the center of pressure for when the plane is flying in ground effect. But problems start to arise when the plane gets a little too high. This causes the center of pressure to shift forward, which makes it tail heavy, which makes it pitch up and go even higher. When it goes higher, the cycle repeats and suddenly the plane is unstable and it violently flips up at a ground effect. Normally the pilot can prevent this by adjusting the airspeed or angle of attack, but sometimes it happens so fast that there's no time to react. This is why some of the ground effect vehicles I've built have had problems with flipping up. I've found the best way to prevent flip ups is by preventing the airspeed from ever getting too high, but I've also had some success with active control systems that use gyros or altitude sensors to actively control the motor angle or elevator, but that's kind of cheating in a way. Ground effect vehicles aren't the only types of vehicles that suffer from this flip up problem. Hydroplane race boats also have their center of gravity balanced for when they're low to the water, so the second they start to get too high, the positive feedback loop kicks in and there's no saving it. They immediately become too tail heavy for stable flight and they blow over. This center of pressure shift is a big challenge when designing high speed boats or ground effect vehicles, and it's the reason why they usually end up being so long and have such large horizontal stabilizers. In brainstorming possible solutions to this problem, I came up with this idea. What if we have a wing with the center of gravity sufficiently far enough ahead of the center of pressure so that the plane is ever so slightly nose heavy while out of ground effect, and definitely nose heavy while in ground effect? And to prevent it from just always nose diving, we have a small planing surface way out front that always stays in contact with the water. This planing surface will hopefully act like a surface following whisker and keep the vehicle always at the perfect altitude. So it will be in contact with the water, but it will still get the vast majority of its lift from the wing, so we'll still get the speed and efficiency benefits of an aircraft. Will it work? Building it is the only way to find out. Step one was to hop into Onshape and start the design. I kept the airframe super simple. The CAD model was basically just to lay out all the dimensions, but I did use Onshape's new CAM feature to make the CNC toolpaths for cutting out the fuselage on my router. I'm pretty stoked that Onshape has this functionality now. The toolpath worked great and my Stepcraft M1000 cut out the fuselage shape with ease. Next I put packaging tape over all the surfaces that would plane across the surface of the water so that they're extra hydrodynamic. I 3D printed some little tabs on the Prusa XL that will clip onto the main wing spar. I decided to make the wing angle of attack adjustable just in case I don't get it right on the first try. The wing is super basic, just two sheets of 6mm Depron that are glued together to make a simple KF airfoil. I glued the carbon spar onto the leading edge of the wing, and once the glue cured I trimmed the foam down flush around the tube to make the leading edge more streamlined. I glued on some winglets stacked as vertical stabilizers, and they also extend down a bit on the water side to hopefully hold the high pressure bubble of air under the wing a bit better. Attaching the wing to the fuselage was pretty easy, it just snaps in place. I'll glue the back down later. To power this aircraft I'm using these two little drone motors from a previous ground effect vehicle project. They are mounted on a pivoting carbon tube so I can vector the thrust up and down. And that whole assembly is mounted to the nose as far forward as possible so that the prop wash can be aimed down under the wing. This is called par thrust and it gives you extra ground effect lift. I connected a servo on there with some M3 rod ends and glued it down to the foam. Now the motor angle can be controlled remotely. How neat is that? I'm trying to get away without any aerodynamic control surfaces, so the motor tilt is basically my elevator. And differential thrust is my rudder. Hopefully it works. Okay, first test of the nose skimmer. Let's put it in the water. Right now I've just got a 1300 milliamp hour 4 cell, so it might be too nose heavy with that battery. Okay, let's see what this thing's got. Oh man, this thing, <laughs> usually it takes some trial and error, but this is like first try, it's just almost perfect. <laughs> this thing is like a floating outhouse. The cabin is 
about the same size and shape of an outhouse. So later that day, I glued on some little canards just above the planing surface to hopefully block the water that was getting sprayed all over the rest of the aircraft. This is a really nasty shoreline. The strakes definitely help with spray. I think it definitely needs a rate gyro on the yaw axis though. It's also really hard to keep going in a straight line. Whoa, it flies. Holy crap, but right when I let off the throttle, it nosed back down. So I think all that is just up thrust from that ever so slight angle that the motors have. The new strakes in the front paired with a little up tilt in the motors would make it take off, which it's not supposed to do. Without the up tilt, it seems to be working decently well. But the yaw axis was really difficult to control, so I added an old KK2 controller and squirted corrosion X everywhere to waterproof it. Or at least to try and waterproof it. So now I've got yaw stabilization. You can see how the motors speed up and slow down as I yaw. So at first I didn't have the yaw gyro rate gain turned up enough, but after cranking it up super high, the aircraft was definitely more controllable. When the airspeed would get too high, it would leave ground effect, so I was wondering if the canards had shifted our center of pressure too far forward. <laughs> oh no! Oh shit. Luckily it's blowing back into the shore, but the shore over here is not exactly conducive to walking upon. As long as I didn't raise the throttle too high, the aircraft was working pretty well. I'd say it had accomplished the original goal of flying in ground effect while the nose skimmed across the surface. But the one thing that really annoyed me was how it was skipping across the surface rather than smoothly planing across the surface. If this were a full-scale aircraft, everyone on board would definitely have a concussion. So next I started trying some wild and crazy ideas to damp out this kind of porpoising oscillation that was going on. So then it was back into Onshape to design a surface following wand. By the way, if you want access to any of these Onshape models, they are free to the public. You can access them through the Onshape link in the description. Many hydrofoiling sailboats use a surface following wand mechanism to adjust the angle of attack of the hydrofoil and thus keep the boat at the right height above the water. I want to try this on my ground effects vehicle, but instead of actuating a hydrofoil, the wand will actuate the motor tilt angle. This is my first time ever 3D printing with Prusa PC Blend, and I gotta say it's a really great filament for airplane parts like this that need to be stiff and light. If this works like I hope it might, the nose planing surface won't even touch the water anymore. The wand will be the only thing that makes contact. Wow, this might actually work really well. This project has me driving back and forth to the lake a lot, and gas isn't cheap these days. But luckily, I've found a way to get cash back at the pump, and it's with Upside, who also happens to be the sponsor of this video. Upside is a free app that gives you opportunities to get cash back on things you already buy, whether that be filling up at the pump, groceries, or eating out. It's great for me because I can take that extra income and buy more gas, which I'm really going to need for all these extra trips to the lake I'm having to do. All you have to do is download the Upside app, search for participating stores, claim an offer for whatever you're buying, pay as usual with a credit card or debit card, and then follow the steps in the app and get paid. There are over 100,000 gas stations, grocery stores, and restaurants using the Upside app, so rewards are just around the corner. People can earn three times more cash back with Upside than they do from other loyalty programs or credit card rewards. In total, Upside has given back a billion dollars to its users. To find out how much you could earn, download the free Upside app and use promo code RCTESTFLIGHT to get 25 cents off of every gallon of gas purchased through Upside with your first tank. Again, that's promo code RC Test Flight to get 25 cents off of every gallon of gas purchased with your first tank using Upside. Thanks to Upside for sponsoring this video. And now back to ground effect vehicle testing. This thing is grossly overpowered, so what I need to do is limit the throttle travel. Now my throttle is capped at only 30% of its normal range. Whoa, I guess it still can fly at this throttle level. And that seems to be... Oh, oh, shit! Not again! God freaking damn it! I hope all these electronics are still working. I guess all that crap I sprayed on the flight controller works pretty well because it's back in action. <laughs> so at this point the motors were tilted up a bit too much. Even with the attenuated throttle level it would still take off every now and then. To reduce the motor tilt angle I changed the push rod location so that the motor angle would change less as the wand moved. This seemed to help with the flip up problem but it was still kind of porpoising on the nose. This could have partially been from a sticky push rod, but anyhow, the next day I added a rubber band to help pull the wand back down. The rubber band maybe helped a little bit, but really not a lot. The nose was still bouncing along the surface of the water, but maybe with the water being ever so slightly bumpy like it is, and with such a lightweight aircraft, skipping along the surface is kind of inevitable. But at this point I was just kind of having fun trying out various crazy ideas. 
My next idea involved ripping everything off the nose and printing some entirely new parts. The idea is to have the nose of the aircraft make contact with the water via surface drive propellers, rather than a planing surface. I made some little speedboat propeller adapters for these small drone motors, and those got mounted on a thing that got glued onto the nose. My hope was that these two motors would generate enough thrust to propel the aircraft, but I guess I can't really call it an aircraft anymore. Here comes the dive boat. I gotta get some test runs in before it makes a bunch of waves. <laughs> Oh no! I think to do anything more than just ventilate on the surface, it needs a lot of speed already because these propellers are super high pitch. So unless they're already moving really fast, they're just gonna flip water out of the way. So to be able to build up enough speed for the boat propellers to be able to start making thrust, I figured I'd put some air propellers back on. I found these little drone motors laying around with some three inch propellers. Now I'm hoping that these things will provide the thrust to get this thing moving and these things will just walk across the water. <laughs> oh man, I don't know about this. <laughs> Another thing to keep in mind here is this thing no longer has par thrust. The lack of par thrust makes it really hard to get up on plane or up on prop, whatever you want to call it. Those little motors ended up being kind of terrible. One of them got water damaged and stopped working, so I ended up gluing the old motors back on. Hopefully now we have enough thrust to make this thing boogie. And I also extended these little canards to hopefully prevent the splashes from these motors from going into these motors. Initially it was a little too tail heavy and it had too much thrust. But after a little bit of fiddling I got the nose to stay down. But then it became even more obvious that the porpoising was even worse than before I had installed the water motors. And at this point there's really no practical reason to try and solve this problem. But I just kept going for the love of tinkering. The next thing I tried was to move the motors down lower. So now the motors are a lot lower than the bottom of the hull here. So it should be riding on the motors alone and not the hull. Hopefully that'll prevent it from skipping. The conditions would be perfect, but there's a bunch of freaking wake boats out there. In hindsight, I don't think that it was bouncing any less than before. Maybe even more if anything. Oh, and it flies. <laughs> and I really don't think the speedboat motors were contributing in any meaningful way. But also, the motors that the speedboat propellers were attached to were super high KV, so they were spinning really fast. It's possible that the boat propellers never really hit their pitch speed, so they were only really just cavitating or ventilating the whole time, and not making any thrust. Tough to say. I just cut a little bit off of the front canards. Maybe a little bit less aero lift will help. Oh, still bounces. Oh yeah, still bounces a lot. It's probably gonna be nearly impossible to prevent it from bouncing when the water isn't just completely flat. I have now placed the Insta360 on the nose, so maybe that little bit of extra nose weight will help it skip less, we'll see. Oh no, I think that makes the bouncing worse if anything. Whoa, did you see that? Once you really increase the throttle, then it seems to stop bouncing. There were a few instances where at higher speeds it would actually start to just hold contact with the water and not skip, but it was really hard to get the vehicle into that state. I think it just required a really specific airspeed or something like that, I'm not sure. Next I'm going to try something even more crazy, and that is putting the water motors on shock absorbers. I made these little 4 bar linkages with TPU springs to hopefully damp out the bouncing. This clearly did not work. The suspension was a bad design and it just kind of bound up. Now the springs are just completely disconnected. <laughs> Let's see if this works at all. Probably won't. I think the issue is that when the thrust from the motor is pushing this way, it kind of locks up the joint. The next day I redesigned the suspension so that it wouldn't bind up. That also didn't work. Now I just took off the springs, so these things are just floating free and clear. Surprise, surprise, but that also did not really work. The next day I decided to try something that I should have tried on day one and that is a V-shaped hull. I printed this V-shaped hull section on the Formlabs Form 4 and stuck it onto the nose. During my last test, these arms were rotating down too much, so the thrust angle was too steep, but now I've limited it by taping the phase wires here, so now they can only rotate down so much. From this shot here, it looks like limiting the suspension droop might have actually worked, but then on subsequent tests, it became clear that it definitely did still get into a lower frequency oscillation. After that I just ripped off the water motors because they're kind of dumb anyways. Now we're testing a V-shaped planing hull alone, with nothing else. At first it seemed great, but then this happened. Oh man, it's way too tail heavy. Without the weight of the motors in the front, it just wanted to take off. I then moved to the battery forward, but after doing that I couldn't keep it going in a straight line. The next day I increased the yaw gyro gain and put more weight on the nose. 
With too much airspeed, it would still try to fly, but with the right amount of airspeed, it would skim across the surface with elegance and grace, and not bounce too much. Like right about there is perfect. Yeah, look at that. Gold. So in order for something like this to work on a more practical level, you just need really accurate airspeed control. In an attempt to help prevent accidental flip up, I'm gonna cut these canards way down. The canards kind of do defeat the whole purpose of this, uh, this whole concept. Oh yeah, that's working a lot better. Okay, now I'm gonna try and really push it and see if I can get it to leave ground effect and flip up. Oh, it just nosedived. At this point, it would only really try to fly up if I gave it way too much throttle. It was still bouncing a tiny bit, but much less than it was earlier in this video. Then again, maybe that's just because the water is calmer over here. I do, however, think that an even deeper V-shaped hole would make it bounce less. Here's a fun camera angle. I was hoping to see the V-shaped planing hole on the water, but in reality, the camera itself was actually planing on the water, and the V-shaped hole was just barely touching it. Not exactly the outcome I was looking for. But anyways, that was a lot of trial and error. Mostly just error. I still think that with a deeper V and precise airspeed control, this could be made to work a lot better. But from a practicality perspective, the idea just isn't great. It's probably not wise to extrapolate our findings from this ultra lightweight little aircraft to full scale, but just in general, look how smooth and majestic this thing is. And then in contrast, how bumpy and violent this thing is. If you want to go fast, it definitely seems better to just avoid touching the water at all costs, if possible. As for the blowover problem, the best way to avoid it is just a longer airframe with a large horizontal stabilizer. So the outcome of this project was maybe a little less spectacular than other projects I've done, but it's still all good training data for our mental models on how ground effect vehicles behave, and I still have a lot of fun tinkering with this stuff. Good news everyone, the color shadow lamp now has party mode. It's available with a firmware update. Party mode fades through the RGB colors in a sine wave, and the knobs on the back control saturation, speed, and overall brightness. It's perfect for house parties. These lights are not exclusive to pirate-themed parties. In fact, they don't complement the pirate theme very well at all, but who cares? My favorite thing to do is put two color shadow lamps side by side in party mode, and have the fade speed of each one slightly out of sync. This makes the colors cycle out of phase and you randomly get short periods of really awesome color combinations. It doesn't exactly have anything to do with the color shadow effect, but it's still really cool. I also had one pointing at a disco ball, but I think the shadow cast by the ball itself was cooler than the actual reflections from the mirrors on the ball. Anyhow, the color shadow lamp is back in stock and shipping now. If you're interested, you can check it out at the link in the description. And for those interested in party mode, I made a video showing how to update the firmware. And also don't forget to unlock high power mode if you haven't done so already because you'll definitely want the light to be as bright as possible for your next rager. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Bye.